All right. Thank you so much for coming this morning. Uh, my name is Dominic Malone, and for the next uh, few hours of the day, I'm going to be the chief curator at uh, the Contemporary Art Museum, St. Louis. Um, this uh, artist talk is really special, not only because it's my last one uh, as a employee here. I'll be moving on to the RISD Museum in Providence, Rhode Island, uh, but um, also because of the extraordinary group of artists and architects uh, assembled here. Uh, we will be talking about the exhibition uh, that we just opened, Places the Space, uh, which is the result of a number of uh, convergences, conversations, conspiracies, in the best sense of that word. Uh, the exhibition began as a result of my interest in really restoring uh, much of the space of the building that had been covered over, walled up, and, and so forth for the sake of, you know, showing art. Uh, and it took a really interesting uh, turn in detour when uh, Brad Clopeville, the architect of the building, um, really created, uh, had this bold suggestion that we co-curate a show together. And so um, knowing that uh, we had a 10th anniversary coming up, uh, of the museum, I thought this would be an ideal way uh, to really celebrate uh, the building, to, to do an exhibition with Brad and to do uh, an exhibition that uh, really focused on new projects by artists uh, that would uh, address particular aspects uh, of uh, this incredible building. Um, and so, uh, due to the imagination and vision of these uh, five artists that are in the show, um, it came to light, and I think I hope it looks great to everyone. It looks great to me. Um, today's talk will feature a conversation between myself uh, and Brad and, and the, some of the participating artists in the exhibition, followed by a brief question and answer period. Uh, before we begin, uh, a plug and some thank yous. Uh, artist Dominique Pettigon uh, will not, well, actually, he will be speaking today. <laughs> and uh, Bandy will also uh, be presenting a, a fantastic performance uh, tonight uh, at 8 p.m. in our conference room space. So please come back uh, to hear that. Uh, I want to recognize the funders uh, of the exhibition, the William Weiss Foundation, the Elizabeth Firestone Graham Foundation, uh, and the Flanders Ministry Ministry for Culture, Sports, Youth, and Media, the Kingdom of Belgium. Uh, I also wish to thank the board of directors here at CAM for their leadership of the institution, uh, Director Lisa Melandri for her support and oversight, and the entire staff, past and present, that I've worked with at CAM, who've helped me realize some of uh, my proudest moments as a carrier. I am truly, truly humbled. Uh, I also want to thank uh, Brad for his uh, generosity and good cheer as a co-curator. Uh, it's not every day that you get to work with a true visionary, and I've been flattered to create this show with him, uh, and of course, obviously, the artists uh, who've come together uh, with us. Um, I'll do some brief introductions. Brad Clopeville is the founding principal of Allied Works Architecture. In addition to CAM, he has designed and reconfigured some of the most distinctive and definitive buildings of the past decade, including the Clifford Still Museum in Denver, the University of Michigan Museum of Art, and the Museum of Arts and Design in New York. Carla Rocha and Stefan Schreinen are artists based in Antwerp and have been working collaboratively since 2005. Uh, their work will be featured in forthcoming solo exhibitions at Isabella Chernovska, uh, opening on September 20th in Berlin. Uh, they have a large show, uh, new show of new work happening in Zagreb in two, summer 2014, and uh, a major traveling survey of their work uh, beginning at the garage in uh, Brussels? Uh, Mechelen. Mechelen, Belgium in the fall of 2014. Uh, Jill Downen is based in Kansas City. In 2010, she was named a John Simon Guggenheim Memorial Foundation Fellow and has presented her work in solo exhibitions at the University of North Texas Art Gallery, Denton, Texas, and the Luminary Center for the Arts in St. Louis. Inigo Manglano Valle is based in Chicago and was named a John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation Fellow in 2001. His work has been featured in numer numerous solo exhibitions internationally, including presentations at the Power Plant Toronto, uh, the Massachusetts Museum of Contemporary Art in North Adams, and the Art Institute of Chicago. And Dominique Pettigon, uh, his work has been presented at the Biennale, uh, Biennale d'Art Contemporain de Lyon in, 2000, in 2011 and in exhibitions at the Abbaye de Maubisson uh, in France, uh, the Casino Luxembourg and the Musée Royal de Beaux-Arts de Belgique in Brussels in 2004. 
Uh, my first question goes to Brad. Uh, the very fact that you suggested that we co-organize an exhibition is pretty extraordinary, as my impression of architects is that they tend to move on to the next thing rather than on dwelling on previous buildings. What's so special about the CAM building to you, and what are your impressions of how it's functioned since it opened in 2003? Um, yeah, that was, that was a many, many part question. Um, <laughs> the, the impetus to, to want to participate in the conversation of curation comes well, it began with this museum um, and the scale of the building. I mean, it's interesting to see it all opened up again, too, back to its original spatial character. And I think one of the things I always felt about this building, partly because of its nature as a, a non-collecting contemporary art museum, partly because of its excessively low budget, <laughs> and partly because of just the open nature of the space itself, that it was always incomplete. And the only thing to complete it both because of the mission and, and the opportunities, is the art itself. So to be part of the conversation in some ways of completing the building, or you know, a, a way of completing the building and participating in that conversation was really exciting. So I just threw that, threw that out there. I didn't think he'd actually do it. <laughs> <laughs> um, and of course, you know, co-curation is a, is a light term relative to Dominique because he's, he's, the real, he's the real master. But we had some wonderful conversations about it. Uh, but you've kept up, you've kept, you know, a pace with, uh, you know, how the building is, has gone. How do you feel it's sort of changed, or how are your impressions of it um, 10 years on it's, in relationship to other things you've done, to right. museum architecture? All of that in general. Wow, yeah. these are big questions. Right. Um, <laughs> I'm really happy with it. I mean, when I walked in last night and saw it all opened up, it was a thrill just to see the, the space itself and the character of, of the space. And it certainly was, I mean, it's, it's the beginning piece for whatever, whatever it is, five or six different museums that we've done now. And they're all very, all very different and they have different missions, so of course they're quite different buildings. But a lot of the principles of the space, this sort of, this sort of weaving of the concrete and the ambiguity of the inside and outside and the you know, space that goes over, under, and around, and you know, all, all of those issues of something that's bounded yet not bounded uh, continue out through, throughout the work and really began here in response to, to this museum. But so it still, it still feels vital, but that has everything to do with the work too. I mean, there's so many museums I've been in and we've had this conversation, you know, where well, there's, there's sort of two, two, I think, mistakes in, in architecture for museums. One is when the architecture tries to complete the, complete the conversation. You know, when the architecture tries to be the resolution of the museum, which I would think, in some ways, what you were alluding to, mm -hmm. Dominique, maybe was that, where architects feel like this museum is complete with the architecture, I've sort of done it all, you know, they'll decorate it with some art and I'll be on my way. <laughs> um, and I do think that's a prevalent uh, uh, misconception with, with architects that way. So I think in, in this case, that openness of the building that affords opportunities of completion and extending the conversation is fantastic. And then I've seen some really beautiful galleries that are sort of moribund because of the, the, the curators not understand, you know, not inviting the right art artists to the conversation, <laughs> right? I mean, there, there's art that works in certain galleries and art that no matter what you do is probably not gonna work in that yeah. space. And a lot of curators, lo and behold, don't, don't see that. So I think that's what's exciting about this too, is that Dominique obviously understands the space and invited people to the conversation that seem to have had a lot of fun, had a lot of fun with it. Um, I'm gonna actually extend one to Carla and Stefan. Uh, you're the uh, lone collaborative uh, group of the uh, artists uh, participating. I'm wondering if you could unpack how the collaboration got started, but also how it functions, uh, and specifically in relationship to site-specific projects like this one. <coughs> <coughs> Hello. Um, well, there's, there's maybe a slight misunderstanding of... I of, of your question. <laughs> <laughs> no, there, there might be a slight misunderstanding uh, of how or if we are in situ artists or mm -hmm. not. I think um, since most, I, this is clearly an in situ piece. Um, 
mostly when we have a show that is that is um, like a solo show where there's like a lot of works. There's always we we most I, we normally don't create a piece and then a piece and then a piece and then a piece. What we mostly do is when we have a show, we have a concept or an idea that we want to treat. And then we will go see the space, and according to that space, we will create a, a thinking machine, like a set of objects, a set of works, paintings, sculptures, objects, that once the spectator or the, the viewer will go through that space, he will understand the, the, the editing of these props or these objects. And that the, 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 the choreography of the viewer through that space, that you use the space kind of as a, yeah, as you would use the, the movie as a, as a set mm -hmm. of rules. Mm -hmm. And that putting all these objects in there, you will re-edit or edit the, the, the sub-narrative. And so, that the, mostly we go see the space, and then the, whole, the, the concept, the, the content, will crystallize in 15 minutes, an hour, 15 days, half a year, of uh, pondering and, and, and thinking about how are we going to use that object to make that movie. You would say we practically curate our own shows. Absolutely. Mm. Mm. According to the space, but we yeah. know that all these objects have a, a, a life of their own because they go to a, a collector, a, a museum, but that the first time, or the first time we show it, it has a set of rules that we use according to that space, but if we would show the same set of objects in an other space, yeah, we would install them completely differently. And that's where they become, to, some ex to a certain extent, in situ. Mm. Um, but, uh, okay. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, someone whose work, you know, is kind of looking at not only a specific space, but in particularly this space, and kind of going back and looking at it, uh, is Jill Downen. And so, Jill, I'm really curious as to what has changed since you last you know, worked with the space in 2004. Your piece really readdresses uh, a piece that you had created for Great Rivers Biennial back then. And so coming back nine years later and sort of thinking about it and, and kind of working again at CAM, I'm, I'm curious as to if you could describe that process and experience. Oh, wow. It, uh, what a great question. Um, it's almost like falling in love all over again. Uh, with the, I, I, fe I feel like I have this very intimate relationship with this particular building. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I really love the idea of empty space. And I love the idea of going into architecture when it's, when it's empty and responding to the empty space, which is what I did in 2004. Um, for many years now, my work has dealt with the human body and its relationship to architecture. And I really believe that uh, architecture is a prolongation of the self. It is an extension of our bodies, um, and it's something that we understand phenomeno phenomenologically through our senses. Um, so for me to uh, come back and, and be invited to do a show in this building, um, I immediately asked for the same corner and the same crack in the concrete floor that I addressed in 2004. And so what you're seeing today in this, this piece, which is situated over on the, in the corner, the kind of white on white, high relief, and then the gold leaf crack, is it's kind of like um, seeing a person that you haven't seen in 10 years. Mm -hmm and they have evolved and you have evolved, but yet you recognize them, even though maybe their skin is different or their, their physical appearance is different, but the, the hidden aspects of their character um, are deeper and more subtle and um, uh, it, it's very, very difficult to describe. Um, personally, my, my own development as an artist I believe has, has grown and matured, and I feel like it started in this building 10 years ago. It was my first major museum exhibition. It was my most ambitious site-specific temporal installation at that time. And uh, since then, I've had the, the opportunity to continue to work on a large scale. Um, but the, probably the most important thing that has happened for me creatively is that with each installation that I take apart and destroy in the process, I'm, I'm learning that 
uh, destruction is part of uh, creativity. And um, this idea of um, healing scars or revealing the hidden marks that a previous installation had made is, is becoming really important. And I like that idea of making the invisible visible. Mm. Uh, you mentioned uh, this uh, you know, notion of working on a large scale, and uh, it's something that when thinking about the uh, kind of volume of the main galleries and how um, that was going to be dealt with uh, in terms of um, uh, thinking about the show, uh, Inigo, your work really uh, came to mind uh, since I think so many of the subjects in your work, icebergs, houses, uh, you know, um, clouds, uh, are really re require uh, working on a particular scale. And so I'm wondering if you could respond to, you know, kind of how scale plays out in your work and, you know, how it's kind of evolved or, or defined the way that you pr uh, work. Yeah, that's an interesting question, especially after yesterday I was forced to go up the St. Louis Arch. Forced? <laughs> <laughs> egg thing. I didn't force it. Small egg thing. And um, I was, thinking about that monument and that ribbon. You know, I was thinking about the ribbon that you talk about when you're creating the concrete here. And, um, and then joking around with Stefan and Carla about monumentality <laughs> and this big black cube and you know how small <laughs> it is <laughs> in comparison to Sarah's <coughs> gesture, right? Or, or even thinking about the scale of Anish Kapoor's uh, cloud gate in Chicago and then Sarah's the gesture, right? So monumentality is kind of a relative uh, a, a, a relative proposition in, in many cases. Some of my work uh, deals with uh, cloud or storm systems that are 30 kilometers wide and end up being 16 feet long in a space. So there's um, Obviously, there, there's a volume in this space that, that I wanted to address because it was a con kind of uh, a beautiful sort of light-filled container. Um, and I wanted to fill it with the opposite, right? So to that sort of light-filled transparency of the building, I wanted to sort of address something with, with that was somewhat impenetrable. And then deal with another aspect of the building, which is its subtle application of texture and touch throughout the building. And so how does one apply that to that? But you know, I was talking to uh, Dominique this morning at breakfast, and we were talking about the scale of works in the show. And in my consideration, D Dominique's sound piece has the largest scale of the show. It, it sort of occupies the entire uh, building, mm. as it were, on, on, on three dimensions and uh, four dimensions. And you know, I think that we might talk about also four dimensions in regards to uh, all the work that is time, right? Mm. How maybe perhaps it might be a recording that is the vehicle of time, but most often it's the public that is the vehicle uh, of uh, a time experience in a building or with work. Well, thank you, Inigo, for providing the perfect segue to ask a question of Dominique, which is, uh, you know, this notion of, um, you know, the sound can live in so many uh, spaces, and certainly your piece encourages sound to live in many spaces here uh, at the museum. Uh, you know, whether it's headphones, speakers, other sorts of ways, or in your car. Um, so I'm kind of curious as to how you consider making sound really function in a way that is very specific to a space in your installations. Uh, I will. I will try to explain the way I process to, to do that kind of sound installation. I, I can say that first, um, I'm, I always uh, work in two times. The first time is when I am at home, I record sounds, I edit them, and try to tell stories. And the second time is how, when I think about how do, can I uh, diffuse them in spaces. So for the second time, I have to visit 
the museum, the art center, etc. And so I came here. But when, when I, before I came somewhere, I, I have a kind of repertory of different pieces. And my f uh, main pre preoccupation when I come somewhere is to find a minimum of some parameters who can uh, help me to decide what kind of narrative and what kind of sound piece I can put somewhere. Is it clear? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so when I came here, the f f after a few moments, uh, one, one thing was obvious for me, it was the, that I can use the floor, the first floor here, when we are, and, some, and to do something with the mezzanine here. Because the, the, as I do sound pieces, the difficulty for me, as, as you say, that when you put a sound somewhere, the sound is playing everywhere. And uh, uh, each time I, would, I want to propose to the visitor a, 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 a rich, rich experience of something so, uh, which needs several steps, steps, several levels of something. So, to, so the, the way to, to, to propose a, an, a, a rich approach of something, first, the, for me, is to cut the sound in several parts and to cut this experience in several moments. Perhaps this mm -hmm. is uh, like when, when we say the, something about time or movie, it's to create a, a sequence or something. And for sound, it's difficult because the, when you heard a sound, it's here and the, <coughs> that's all. So the two levels permit first to create two moments. One moment when you are here, one moment when you are there. And uh, the piece I propose is also the, mo the movement permits you to understand something else after listening the different levels of the sound. And especially for this piece, here you can hear some noises, and then you hear a voice. And when you hear the voice, you understand that these noises are like a language, because each sentence of the speech is connected, linked to the, these noises. But so, but what I said, it, it, perhaps it's after visiting, after coming back at home and, and thinking uh, about something. So I decide to do that. But during the installation, during the week I spent here in St. Louis, I have I had to, co to, to, tr to work also with other parameters, which are the works, the other works in the show. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and for me, some, something uh, which was very helpful and difficult was the big square <laughs> and black square here. <laughs> <laughs> because I know that I have to combine something with that. Uh, when I think about the, the piece I would like to show here, I, I decide to, to, to put to, uh, five speakers, one for the voice and four here for the noises. So I must install um, um, four speakers here. And, uh, and four, it's like black little boxes on the ground, and it's like four points, and the difficulty was do I have to do a square or not, or rectangle, or a geometrical figure or not? Because mm -hmm. for the sound, it would not be very different, the position of each speaker. Because in this big volume with the reverberation, if I put a sound somewhere, you can hear it. Perhaps the question was perhaps the direction of the speaker. But the position was not so important, uh, actually. So I have to. To, to work with also the visual aspect of that. And the square was uh, something great to, to do some opposition or not, or something to combine with. And, uh, and after, the, the other piece with the diagonal was a good uh, indication for me to a kind of limit of, this, of the space, etc. And, uh, and this is why I appreciate to be that kind of show, 
is also because there was not so many works, so it's better to and so many uh, things to combine with. You know. okay, thanks. I'm going to riff off of uh, something Brad alluded to earlier, which is um, this notion of you know kind of how museums function uh, and whether they do or not. Uh, and then so this question is more for the group. Um, I found this building to be incredibly hospitable for artists, with some artists actually seeking out the opportunity to work here based on what they've seen of the building. Uh, other artists that have worked here, in my experience, have actually really changed their ch exhibitions dramatically because of the building, because of a real desire to want to play to uh, this building's many strengths. Um, I'm wondering, we've heard Brad's uh, opinion from the architect's perspective as to what makes a good or bad uh, museum space, but as artists who've been able to work in, in museum spaces, I'm wondering if you could respond to what makes a good or bad uh, museum space to work in. Anyone? I have an opinion on that. Okay, good. <laughs> uh, we, we were actually talking uh, last evening about the importance of empty space and the importance of quiet. Mm. And I think that this is something um, Americans don't always do very well, uh, and we can do better. And, um, you know, for architecture um, to have voids and to have uh, like a resonant space. I think is, is really important because everything is ultimately contextual and it's set in relationship and so the, the museum needs to consider its relationship to the art and the art needs to consider its relationship to, to the space within the museum and you know it's, it's, it's a give and take, it's a two-way street and I think um, the idea of empty space or quiet um, as a way to transition between experiences um, is really important. And, and we should also talk about light, because now mm. I'm becoming, the, the longer I'm an artist, the more of a natural light snob I become. Uh, I love natural light in museums, so. Which is funny, because you talk to many, you know, a sort of museum professional from the opposite direction, and natural light is sort of like the bane of, you know, it's the reason that so much of these windows have been, you know, covered over for times because of mm -hmm. uh, photo, uh, photography sensitivity to it, other works of art sensitivity to it. So it's interesting to hear from the sculptor that uh, <laughs> pro-natural light. Much of the museums covered their natural light for mm -hmm. years. I mean, and it's supposedly because the world can't have it, but oil painting can be in the sun for like, I don't know how many years, and it's called kind of gorgeous. Mm. It's true for works on paper, but there's, a, there's this kind of idea that it's bad for the art or something. No, that there's this misconception that art can't have daylight, and that most of the museum, like in Chicago or in, or in San Francisco, or they, they always they cover their daylight. And painting can have as much daylight as, it, uh, as there is, I mean. But Brad, your idea to you know kind of have the building be very open was really prompt. You know that really prompted the use of, of the windows and the multiple use of windows in the space. Well, it, it, there was a couple of reasons this building is open. Again, every building is different. It was partly just to make the building feel transparent. You know, I guess part of the primary missions of you museums, they they by nature because they have to be secure, they create a kind of sacred domain, right? And this being a contemporary museum and wanting to be more a part of the conversation of culture, you know, the, the tension between that sense of closure and then the connection to the street, the window at the corner, I always used to say that, you know, when someone's driving by on the way to get a 12-pack down the street at the mini mart, <laughs> they actually see in here and go, what the hell is that? <laughs> and I think that's a victory for, for the museum if that happens. And so just to try to get some sense of immediacy when by nature you're really trying to as an architect, you have to provide control and, and, and separation. And the, and the light question in this museum, there's so many misconceptions. You know, now that I'm involved in all of these different museum projects with all these different co collections, this is a non-collecting museum. I mean, unless a piece of work, however fragile, is here for over six months, you know, or, or it's beeswax and it, you know, it, can't, it can't be in that, that one little slice of sunlight, it's fine. Yeah. I mean, I, 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 I know the science, I know, I know the conservation rules. I'm very familiar with it all right now, but there's a reactionary 
you know, some sort of backlash from mm. some period mm -hmm. in history that none of us know anymore. <laughs> Well, I think this question might uh, induce a few groans, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Um, because the group assembled here, while not all based in the American Midwest, uh, have an extensive history of making artworks, exhibitions, art museums uh, in this part of the country. And I'm wondering if uh, everyone could reflect on whether there are you know, particular dynamics of working with contemporary art uh, in this part of the world, especially since some of you can now assess it from an international perspective, Carla you know, having grown up and, and lived in Chicago for some time, now based in Antwerp, you know. I have seen so many different places in a short lifetime now. That I, say, I have to say that it is, seriously, it is a two-way street. It's like if you, by whatever reason, you get a space that probably is not bad, but you don't like it, you have to <laughs> deal with it. Mm -hmm. yeah? And is this, this is a lucky happening that we have a space that we like. But it's like, uh, I don't know, it's like I cannot really make that difference. I go back to Clermont-Ferrand, which is probably the most outrageously difficult space in the whole white world. It's the most stable. Yeah, it was Napoleon the most stable, with the arches. It was, I but, mean, you know, spaces are challenging, I, I think. Yeah. But so it's like, you gotta, you know, speak with that. It's like, you have to deal with that. Mm. And that's why for us it's like extremely important to always see the space before we put a show in. Mm. But not only the space, but the reception of how, you know, the workers well, perceive. But, here, yeah. but like here, here in the American Midwest, and, you know, the, or the working process as artists. Okay. <laughs> Do you know? Joe? <laughs> uh, you know, I, I, um, it's a curious question, uh, you know, how or, how or why is, is making art different in the American right. Midwest as opposed to making it any place else? Mm. Uh, I, I think, you know, as an artist, I, I have my process, I go through my process, I have uh, a way of being and understanding and responding in the world that, um, in some respects, that it, it doesn't matter where I am, mm. and uh, working site specifically, um, I will respond to each situation. Mm -hmm. um, I will say that my career has uh, developed and remained in the Midwest, and that is partly by choice. Mm -hmm. uh, I can afford to make the kind of work that I want to make here in the Midwest. If I was situated on the coast, um, I, I don't think that the real me could come out. Mm -hmm. I, I would feel very uh, held, held down. Mm -hmm. um, because I'm ultimately a space hog and I need lots of big space and I like lots of open space. And, and you can do that in the Midwest and, um, and do it in an affordable way. And th that's the pragmatic side of it. Mm -hmm. I think the question is more like, why do you ask this question about yeah. the Midwest? <laughs> <laughs> I think, you know, because I think in there, there are certain, um, I think there's a particular kind of, uh, sensibility I think that mm -hmm. exists or in terms of I think you know an, uh, the audience's perspective on uh, on the work or on uh, contemporary art which is um, you know I think different or there's a different kind of cultural context within which uh, one works in um, in this in this part of the world uh, in terms of you know I think there's often you know what I've often find really rewarding and surprising is how um, free one can be, I think, in, in terms of, uh, you know, not being hemmed in by, uh, you know, kind of almost uh, oppressive or stifling uh, places like, you know, New York or Los Angeles, mm. where, you know, it's like, it's almost like you're too uh, wrapped up in, in the fishbowl. Here you can actually maybe have a clearer, longer view of what goes on in the larger uh, context of things. Um, I'm going to actually open it up to uh, the floor, and hopefully you all will have you know, better questions than I did uh, <laughs> for, for our folks here. Yep. Oh. Mm 
Mm -hmm. it's, it's interesting in that, in that yeah, I, I did a drawing <clears throat> when I was telling, <clears throat> excuse me, Dominic about this, I did a drawing in the interview with a cup shape that was closed to the ground and a cup shape that was open and the one that was closed to the ground was the Ondo and ours was, I mean, the, the aspiration of this is that it was the open one. But it, it's, it's interesting that way in the nature of institutions and this, this question of control I think it also has to do with the, with the inspiration of the commissioning, whether you're collecting architecture or art, right? Or whether you're commissioning architecture or art. There's a, you know, there's an enormous collector's culture in architecture now where you want the object, you want the precious object. And architects are more than happy to, to fulfill that market and provide those objects to be collected and put in major cities around the world. And I think both because of my view towards architecture and where I was in my career, it was a much more open question. I mean, I really had no idea what to do. And you're right, with a very, very, you know, profoundly powerful and beautiful neighbor, the, the, it, was, it was somewhat daunting. But I think the inspiration of the mission and the inspiration of the context, I mean, especially 10 years ago, we all know, it was a rather desolate urban place and kind of breathtakingly beautiful in some way. And just, you know, starting with the forces, I, that was something I just wanted, maybe my, my last little comment, but gathering the forces, I think everyone, you know, listening to the artists, whether you're editing the space or amending the space or juxtaposing things, what, you know, but you're responding to a set of conditions and forces that are here and redirecting them and re, reconfiguring and re-perceiving them in, <coughs> in the, black, the black hole um, is so exciting and I think, I think at least for me, that's one of the most powerful and interesting things that architectures can do is they can do that to the city or do that to the landscape. That we perform that same function mm -hmm. on the forces mm -hmm. of the city and the forces of the landscape. And I think, again, back to the original question about curation, what was exciting for me is I think we did that through the context of St. Louis where we are. I mean, that, that conversation was started with this building, but then because of the scale of architecture and the need to create this void, the, the conversation stopped. And again, with, without this extension through the art and through the artists, it's really, it's a really a complete, an incomplete conversation. And missing that relationship to the body too, right? Because it's so big. You know, it, I, I think of the art in many ways in museums as being the bridge to the body, right? Because some of these spaces are, are so big in museums. You know, and, and we've all seen it, the Turbine Hall in, in London. And, mm -hmm. you know, w without the art, mm -hmm. you, you're, you're almost intimidated. You can't even go in there, yeah. you know? <laughs> right? I mean, you, you need that sort, of, that, that sort of bridge to the infinite or whatever, whatever it might be that the artists offer. Yeah, mm. I, I would agree. Um, although, I think that probably the spirit of this building is a recognition that experience doesn't begin once you come in. You know, there's some things that have been said, which is about how an empty, you know, a building is empty or the experience of the viewer. I mean, I think that the building also locates itself within not just this specific landscape or that specific neighbor, but within the history of architecture and the art locates itself, even when it's as specific as possible to a situation also locates itself within a larger sort of the history of art making, art practices, art experiences, and, and the public, and I think as you put it, is not only the br bridge to that, but it also actually is the, uh, the, the, the primary sort of vehicle for bringing all of those histories into it. In other words, um, I think Many times, we propose in contemporary spaces that you know you, that you will arrive and have an experience. <laughs> I, I hear that so much in missions, objectives, ads for contemporary spaces. Rather than recognizing that the public actually is bringing hmm. their experience, and without those experiences, and I mean. If it were not so, then the public would be this kind of neutral sort of sponge <laughs> right? that you could manipulate. And that's but not true. The public is highly critical before it walks in the door, when it walks in the door, 
when it leaves the door and you have to sort of connect to those histories. So some works that even are specific to a building here must always connect outside, right? So, or to outside histories. If you're talking about architecture, in this case, it's kind of refined architecture, you might want to point to <coughs> other vernacular architecture, or other moments of architecture, or you might want to point to natural architecture or point out the window. Uh, so it doesn't, so both art, the building, and, um, and the experience is in some sort of kind of vacuum. I had that experience yesterday, the egg going up. Mm -hmm. right? So you're inside this sort of vacuum. You're nowhere for about 10 minutes, right? You're sensing you're going up, but you're nowhere, right? Until you get out there and you look at it. And what was interesting to me was to look at everybody looking, everybody looking. And uh, people looking at something they hadn't seen before, maybe experienced, maybe interpreting, getting a view of St. Louis, getting a view of that Illinois, <laughs> flat, nothing landscape. Um, but those moments in which we uh, also inhabit the building. So what's interesting to me in looking at spaces like this that operate with space and generosity is just watching that individual right now as they move around and become um, part of uh, part of that experience, and you know that's why this is a contemporary. This is kind of a Kunst hall rather mm -hmm. than a museum. Mm -hmm. So you rightly put it. I mean, there's mm -hmm. a, its aspirations are not to acquire, right, but to mm -hmm. sort of uh, in some cases generate, mm -hmm. in some cases uh, mm -hmm. uh, create uh, uh, opportunities. But I think most importantly in the works that are here is that each artist is involved in the notion of creating a situation, not an object, <clears throat> not a vision, but a situation in which they can only leverage the entry, just like you, and can sort of say, okay, that's going to be the entrance. Right? <laughs> but I'm not going to uh, tell you, mm -hmm. but uh, now I'm going to create an open building because I'm not going to dictate how you flow through this building, nor the artists here are, have a unique understanding of how art leverages that first entry, mm -hmm. and then the situation is then under control of the viewer. And if it were not so, then the art would be talking down to the viewer instead of understanding mm -hmm. that the viewer is a critical subject mm -hmm. and, uh, and a vital subject of, of the work mm -hmm. itself, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, a, a conversation between work? Between works, I guess. Oh. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, in most cases, in most cases, what the artist wants is a room for themselves, right? And no, <laughs> no they want a conversation with you, and, and, but no conversation with other artists. No, no, right? So, because artists, really, what they want to do is to be loved, and to be loved <laughs> by you, and we don't want to share that love, <laughs> right? and but it's interesting. I think uh, uh, Dominique talked about it before the opening, very articulately about how all of these pieces are in conversation. Like when I came in and I saw Dominique's move, see how he snuck in that <laughs> speaker, <laughs> and you see it, and it's like pointing at the black box, and it's sort of like 
you know, squawking at it, and the black box is kind of. Like, <laughs> and there's a, um, a, a kind of a critique that's there, right? That uh, actually expands sort of the notion of his work, but in, in, in a way, in, in its subversion of this sort of like the kind of uh, juggernaut aspect of that work, it actually opens up uh, the work, it's that work, right? So, in, in a strange way. So I kind of liked it. I kind of liked this sort of um, kind of going under the barbed wire, sneaking in, and then addressing architecture uh, in that way. Because in, in the way, I think that little black box is addressing architecture the way that black box is addressing architecture. Mm -hmm. you know. <coughs> <coughs> Right, and then the, the quiet, the modest gold line by Jill is yeah. sort of like severe, right? It's, for an artist, it's severe, right? Because when I came mm -hmm. in, I had in mind to do, I was told, okay, that space into this space. So I had in mind to do this horizontal piece. And then I was told about Jill's mm -hmm. gold line and shown a picture of a previous work that she had done there. And now <coughs> it became a cavern. That little gold line for me was, a Grand Canyon, right? Mm -hmm. And so either I had to engineer over it, right? Or I had to cover it or something. And I chose, it, I chose to figure out a way to engage with it without sort of falling over the crevice, right? Or, or filling it, right? And uh, it's, a, it's a great, I think it was a great opportunity. I mean, even the Thomas Beiler work, mm -hmm. which is not part of Place in space, right, mm -hmm. is so great in this exhibition, right? Because it's the Chrysler driving in, you know, to the space, you know? And, uh, I don't know. What do you think about that conversation? Oh, very, very. I mean, Inigo, thanks for your comments. I, I think I'm still beginning to understand and learn about this new relationship. Um, and I, I, I do see the gold-leafed crack as something that's very subtle and very quiet. I mean, there were people yesterday standing on it, totally unaware that it was under their feet, and there were also people stepping over it and people bending over touching it. And so I think it's operating at um, multiple levels of volume. Um, it's, it's curved relationship to what's happening in the corner um, is a very softened kind of gesture, a very softened kind of arc that weaves uh, between this, uh, between Inigo's work that that um, is using the geometry of the grid and using the the geometry of um, volume and uh, what is penetrable and what is what is not. <coughs> and so I I think that this is a uh, is a new a new window for me to look through and understand my own work um, in relationship to Inigo's. And it's interesting to look at how the photographs are turning out. You know, the whole show is starting to be documented in video and, and photography. And um, I saw a photograph recently of um, the bee boxes in this, you know, white on white on white grid situation space. And then all of a sudden this very organic thing behind it. And I'm, well, that's a really, odd juxtaposition mm. and very strange thing and I'm not sure I understand what that is yet and so I think um, we, we have time. We have time to spend with the work and we, we don't necessarily have to pin it all down right now and answer it and describe it and, and um, package it so to speak and I think that, that this is something I'll come to understand better uh, over the next three months. But it's interesting that you brought up this notion of like the genderedness of um, of the work because the the one artist who couldn't join us, Virginia Overton, I think poses an interesting problem because you know uh, it's work made by women, but it's very butch in a way. Um, you know, it's like this really rugged, un, un Hmm? Yeah, the pipes and ropes, it's like, you know, it's, it's this industrial material, it's not uh, been transformed, uh, but it also occupies the space in, in perhaps a very, you know, kind of aggressive way, uh, but also a very subtle and, and, and elegant way. I was actually thinking, 
uh, about when she proposed this piece about uh, the, the big X sculpture by Ron Bladen uh, from the late uh, 60s that occupied the Corcoran Gallery. Uh, and I think often, you know, kind of entered into those dialogues about minimalist art and what was it? Uh, it was like an essay by Anna Chave, minimalist art in a masculine aggression or something. Uh, you know, the, the, the way that minimalist art was read as this kind of big macho uh, kind of thing and how Virginia is perhaps kind of playing on that, uh, but uh, problematizing it in a certain way. Uh, yes, Martin. Uh, I'm listening and I'm hearing some of you commenting on, uh, or, or I'm getting a sense that you knew about Me, I knew, I knew nothing. <laughs> <laughs> but oh, oh, I, I, I do like I do. I knew nothing before coming and then studying. Yeah. No, I think there was something that was I think pretty crazy. Like you said that everybody wants to be alone in the space. I, t I absolutely don't. I, I understand what you say, but I don't agree with that. No. Me? Yes, <laughs> but <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, no, that you said that for you know, pr pr no, that's artists would prefer to have a, a, a space for their right. own. It's quite uh, ironic. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I, know, <laughs> I know, I know. But the, the, the crazy thing is that when we were all asked to do something here, and you said, Oh, I hope they don't all want the, the, the main <laughs> space. <laughs> no, that we, like, uh, Jill said, I want my corner back. Uh, <laughs> no, we didn't want to do anything in that corner. You didn't want to do anything in that corner. No, and that, that everybody gyrated immediately to, to the space that they have something now. Like we came in, you said, "Oh, I ho maybe hope they do something big in the atrium." We came in and we said, "We're gonna do the window." Period. And that 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 answer to the building in one sense, but as well, uh, if you knew what the other one was gonna do, I think in that way it was all very complimentary. Yeah, and definitely. Mm -hmm. Maybe you knew the artist, but you don't know the work they're gonna put there, and I think there it, it's kind of a, a mind puzzle that functions, rather than being an answer or a question to each and other piece. Yeah, it was a bit of a leap of faith that you all were going to, you know, <laughs> kind of just uh, either play along. I mean, you know, Virginia responded very well to the notion of like addressing, because I think, her, you know, I've invited her because her work, you know, really does often address these architectural voids uh, in particular ways with material. Uh, but yeah, no, I, I was talking to another artist who had done a show at last fall, and she's like, well, good luck, Dominic, because, you know, Sounds like a bit of a crazy proposition, but everyone was really, I think, very gracious in terms of understanding the, the logic of the show and, and being able to really kind of settle into you know, addressing. And I think also, uh, you know, I really had Brad to thank for, um, you know, when in our you know, conversation over, of course, coffee in Portland, uh, you know, and especially strong coffee, that, uh, that we should build the show uh, based on, you know, kind of very specific principles of, of, of things that, you know, really define this building, intersection, uh, boundary, transparent, uh, transparency, scale, et cetera, surface, um, you know, and so that really helped to, you know, kind of, you know, be able to, you know, I both select artists, but also invite artists to respond to these, you know, very specific things. And I think that helped to kind of, you know, put everyone put everyone in their place. Yeah, and I like the, the the premise of the parasite that you first yeah. Yeah. <laughs> addressed. Wonderful. Yeah, and I, I yeah. like that. That I think that that crack has that. Uh, that, yeah. um, mm. that attitude. Mm. I think yeah. the, the window piece has that attitude. I, have yeah. to I think that was a great title. So I really liked it. Yeah, one of the a working title for the show is Parasite Specific, and <laughs> I really like it. Uh -huh. um, That's why we said yes. Oh. <laughs> Sorry for and it was and yeah. I mean, Brad and I uh, in our initial conversations had talked about. Uh, this notion of art's parasitical relationship to a building uh, in terms of artists increasingly working in a way that really uh, was focused on building off of the building. And um, uh, there's an artist in Chicago named Michael Rakowitz who does work that are called parasite-specific, you know, 
11, 12, 13, what have you. Uh, and, but his work wasn't quite in the place of, of, of what the show was going to be, and I didn't want to have this kind of, you know, confusion or, or you know, people expecting or asking, why didn't you put Michael Rackwitz in the show? Um, great artist, perfectly good artist, but just wasn't, you know, right. So, um, you know, I, I thought, you know, because of the way that the space functions, because of the way it informs the space and, or place and place informs the spaces in which uh, the art was functioning, that this kind of inversion of uh, the phrase space is the place, thank you, Sun Ra, uh, would be, you know, perhaps a more interesting, playful, maybe less, slightly less pejorative, uh, you know, way of describing it. I like that it's, it's open to interpretation. That title's kind of very neutral, and, uh, and so the work can become parasitic in the best way. Mm -hmm. But that is yeah, not always are good parasites as like well. Parasite. Yeah. yeah, I mean, for me, uh, you know, I think when you are invited to be in a, a show that has such a specific curatorial paradigm, it's also your job as an artist to take advantage of that paradigm and make work that speaks within that, criticizes that paradigm itself, and says, oh, and I also have the opportunity to speak about something else, mm -hmm. <laughs> completely different than, than that place, that space, the curator's idea, or the dialogue with the other artists. I mean, the work has to sort of fluctuate. Uh, yeah, outside it. So, you, you know, your work, all, all of the work here has uh, its own sort of memory. It is first most in dialogue with its own trajectory, and then the new situation, and then other kind of subject matter. So, like Dominique's work for me, kind of takes me into some, I don't know, there's something very jarring uh, about, I don't, I don't know, glass, you know, and metal clanging. It's, it's kind of very jarring, so it takes me into some other cinematic site, mm -hmm. you know? I mean, it's very, there's some cinematic space or narrative you know, some sort of place of dread <laughs> that that it might carry uh, to, right? Um, and so, and so the, the work kind of operates within another architecture, right? So another architecture of, of in, the, in that case, cinema or uh, another architecture. I mean, your work to me operates in, in, in many sense, even though you're very, obviously very sculptural, in this huge landscape of drawing. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can see it, there is that, that landscape of, of drawing. And I'm really happy actually, because of Tom Baylor's sort of encouragement in, in here, and it's dialogue, that works dialogue, mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. Carl and mm -hmm. Stefan's mm -hmm. is just outrageous. It's mm -hmm. so, um, so incredible. Um, because you have a 70s, work that is about pop and optics to, you know, this mm -hmm. next century work that is, I, I mean, you, a lot of your work is about pop and optics mm -hmm. as well. I mean, not, you know, and so to have those, mm -hmm. those works here in a larger, so then the, there's this larger discourse, right? That, uh, that the, the curatorial paradigm has allowed for the work to sort of negotiate. Well, on that note, uh, I'm going to thank uh, everyone, uh, not only for coming, thank you all, uh, but also our uh, panelists for uh, their generous time and thoughts and uh, for an incredible show. Thank you guys, and uh, thanks for coming. <laughs>